My name is Kristen Olson. I work for the Bureau of Land Management and I am a fire behavior analyst. So we're going to go through what goes into a fire behavior forecast that's used on large scale incidents. Uh, I'll take one from a type 1 incident that was in Arizona just uh, two weeks ago. So the top of the form is your basic information, uh, your forecast number, which is sequential from the day that you start. So even if you started on day three, your first number is going to be your actual first one. It doesn't start from the very first day of the incident. It starts from your first incident. Okay. Um, the rest of it's pretty self-sufficient. The next part is going to be your inputs and the weather summary. Normally, if you have an uh, incident meteorologist on scene, they're going to give you this. If not, you're going to pull it yourself as the FBAN on the fire, and you're going to pull that from the NOAA website. You're also going to, if you're the only one doing it and you have to do both the FBAN and the meteorology, you're going to actually request a spot weather. And you're going to take just the basic information that is general for the whole area. Keying in on any red flag warnings, like this one has a red flag warning in effect again for strong winds and low relative humidities. On the fire that this one was on, the Gladiator fire, we had wind some days in excess of 60 miles an hour. Really big in deal. So the next section is you're briefly going to talk about what's going to happen that day. You're going to talk about if there's any differences in topography, you're going to try to split those out. So this one had a difference in elevation. We had an area that was burning on the mountaintop where we actually saw pine. It was Ponderosa pine in a lower section, which was the valleys, which was a chaparral. It's an inland chaparral community. Mm -hmm. So we split those two up because the way that the weather went through there was differently. So you want to basically key in those two pieces. You're definitely going to want to talk about your Haynes index your max temperatures, your min minimum relative humidities, and your winds. You're going to talk about briefly what's going to happen that evening, specifically your relative humidity recovery, and then uh, a little bit for the next couple days if there's something important that's coming up at least then. The next section that we would be talking about is the output section, and this is the meat of the fire behavior. You're first going to talk about general, and so this is going to be those weather scenarios that are going to impact your fire the largest across the biggest part of the landscape. We're looking still at a landscape level. This fire was 16,000 acres. So from a general perspective, we're looking at 16,000 acres. And then we'll go into the specific down a little further. The big deal here was, again, that 60 mile an hour wind. It was coming from the south. So what was keyed on there is what we're going to see on the fire, which this one, it was Ponderosa Pine up by the mountaintop, so 60 mile an hour winds, we were going to actually see the transition into single and group heat torching. We didn't actually see any prolonged crown, but we did see a lot of torching behavior. Rates of spread is going to be where you're going to talk about here. You're going to talk about spotting distances, probability of ignition, and also what your live fuels are looking like on the ground to give people an idea of basically probability of ignition and rates of spread. So. Specific is your next section, and you're going to talk. It depends on how you look at it. For this one, I looked at the areas that were still burning. So they were grouped into, this one had a, what was still going, Division F, G, C, D, H, and those are just the areas around the perimeter of the fire, and you split them up, group them as much as you can, because you have to fit this on one page. So you're trying to lump where you can. If you need to separate, go ahead and do it. This is where you're going to talk about the minute topographical features that might actually influence your behavior. Also, if you have changes in either topography like slope, or if you're transitioning, or if you have any areas that you might be masking. So there might have been a fuels treatment, or an area that is burning into that was the actual fire before. So you'll mm -hmm. want to talk about those specifically, and the area that it might take. Sure. Also, if you are looking at Ponderosa Pine, for example, we had the top was ponderosa pine. Spotting is going to be very different where you have slope influences. You're going to have a lot more lofting. So that was a big key. So you're going to want to talk about that specifically in each of those divisions. Because you might have a half a mile to a mile in the ponderosa pine, whereas in the chaparral, the inland chaparral, it was only short-term spotting. So that was less than a quarter of a mile, and it was mostly rollout. Very big difference. After you get through the specifics, and really you're trying, you're looking at maybe two to three sentences under each one because it's really important to just dissect the biggest pieces for the people on the line. The next section is going to be air operations and specifically this is just safety, information about air operations. For this one I usually talk about mixing height, the transportation winds, and ventilation. 
because this is going to impact how their loft is, if they're going to hit the ridge lines, if they're going to have turbulence. You'll also want to talk about if there's um, an inversion layer or any operations that might be halted. We hit 60 mile an hour winds again, so I keyed into the strong winds. This may limit the availability of air operations. This is for the actual firefighters on the ground. So you want to dissect that information to what is important to them. And for them, okay. they need to know if they're going to have a couple hours where they're not, they cannot rely on air operations or might not be able to slow down if they have a specific operation that's tied to that, like burnout operation. Okay. After that is basically your safety message at the end, and I generally try to tie that to something important you know, that they can learn from or that it should be a heads up for that particular day. This one I used a quote about experienced judgment, which is for the experienced judgment, except opinion based on knowledge acquired by experience. So basically what he was one of the leading fire scientists in the 1950s, and what he says about experienced judgment is, unless you've seen everything and been anywhere, everywhere where you can see it, don't rely on what your judgment is. Okay. Really keep the heads up. So that's basically the key concepts that are in the actual fire behavior part of the IEP. Thank you very much, Kristen. <laughs>